praise your name. We worship you today, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy that you came and down here you became a man. You lived a sinless life. You died on the cross shedding your blood for our sins. You paid the price. You rose from the dead and you want us to believe that message, that truth, that we need you as our Savior, our Redeemer, our Deliverer, that we need the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus to be saved. And that's the only way to be saved. And anyone saying anything different is a devil, antichrist, liar. And Lord, we just thank you for the truth that's in your word, in history, archaeology, everywhere. You are the way, the truth, and the life, and we worship you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, we want to welcome everyone. Welcome everyone here to Fire and Grace Church this morning. Our small crowd here today, but we welcome you. We welcome those watching and listening. We got visitors uh, from an hour away, and how many hours away are you guys? 13 hours away. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of a drive there, but uh, good to have you guys. All right, you may be seated this morning. We're going to get into the message. As I said uh, last week that uh, this was going to be a series, and I don't know how long it's going to take. In fact, uh, uh, I found out that this part, there's no way I could do it all. So this, this part two is going to also be in part three, but I'm just calling this the sevenfold uh, doctrine of creation, and this is really part two because last week I did a message about this where I introduced this ancient prophecy from the book of Enoch about the sevenfold revelation that would come in the last days to certain people who were walking in righteousness, that there would be a revelation about the sevenfold doctrine or the sevenfold instruction on the whole creation. We're going to look at that again. And then, of course, last week I shared a lot of testimonies of atheists and agnostics uh, that have come to Jesus. They've come back to believing the Bible is the inspired, infallible Word of God. And they've come back to, uh, and through that, they've come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I get testimonies all the time. And so after last week, I'm going to read a little bit of this one. Um, I received this testimony, um, and matter of fact, let's see here. Uh, the, t the, uh, let's see if I can walk up to the camera see if y'all can get this little part right here. I'll try to put it up for him, but it says from atheist agnostic. Can you see it? Kind of. kind of just let everybody know it's for real. I didn't get to put it in the PowerPoint this morning, but anyway, it says from atheist agnostic to born again, Christian because of biblical cosmology or flat earth. That was the title of the email and the brother's name is David Driscoll. He says, um, I used to be in the chat room on your live broadcast every Sunday on Facebook, but around July I had my account permanently disabled for sharing the Gospels and the truth about the shape of the earth. He says, I continue to watch Fire and Grace Church on YouTube. I was watching your latest broadcast, The Flat Earth Awakening Continues. That was last week, and I felt compelled to share with you my testimony of how I became a born-again Christian, even though I lived my life like there was no God for 27 years, but it was because of flat earth. If there are some of your viewers in doubt about biblical cosmology, I want them to be able to see the power of God and the awakening that flat earth has uh, and why um, it is so important. I grew up in a household and lived my life like there was no God. I partied from a very early age. At the age of 11, I was smoking weed and drinking alcohol. All through high school and after high school, I went through a breakup and got into serious drugs. By the age of 20 years old, I was a heroin addict with no purpose in life. Uh, by, age, by the age of 24, after seeing so many of my friends dying around me, I joined a methadone clinic. Around a year into the methadone clinic, uh, while I was still drinking alcohol and smoking weed and cigarettes, I came across a flat earth video. My first thought was, wow, how do people still think the earth is flat? And I laughed at it and didn't think much about it. Then a few weeks later, I came across another flat earth video. 
But this time I said, okay, let me watch it and get a good laugh. Expecting to get a good laugh, I began to watch it, and a few hours later I wasn't laughing at all. It was like in that moment everything clicked and began to make sense. I remember thinking, oh no, if the earth is flat, then God is real. He says, but at this point I still didn't know uh, Jesus Christ, even though I heard the stories everyone else heard about Jesus growing up. Some time passed after having the awakening that we've been lied to and the earth really is flat. I was in the methadone clinic still and had lost all hope in life and had this void in my heart and this emptiness I couldn't explain. I was getting more comfortable with the idea of taking my own life. And on a night I was having these thoughts of killing myself, something happened to me. I had this newfound faith to call out to Jesus Christ. The moment I cried out to Jesus telling him I needed him, that I was sorry for uh, living my life like he didn't exist and I, I wanted to know him. I had this sorrow come over me. I realized that my entire life I lived, I was living a lie and I was feeling contrition for how I lived my life up until that point. Even though I was feeling sorrow, I had this peace come over me and I knew that this was the best decision I have ever made in my life. I woke up the next day with this newfound desire for what the Word of God says. I remember that my mother kept a Bible in her closet, and she would keep prayers and eulogies of dead relatives, but she never read it. He said, but I remembered she had it because I would see it as a child. So I went up to her and asked her for the Bible. And with a strange look, she gave it to me. <laughs> that day was the first time I opened up a King James version of the Bible and began to read the New Testament for myself. The moment I began reading, I couldn't get enough of it. I felt like I'd been starved for this my entire life. I felt like it was speaking to me, and it began to take up my thoughts throughout the entire day. Little by little, through reading the Word of God in prayer, I began to see my desires changing in life. I began to have knowledge of sin in my life. The knowledge of sin, I was convicted and produced a godly sorrow in my life, which led me to repentance. I went through a process uh, through a process of around three years reading the Word of God over and over. And um, anyway, he, he just, um, he, it just goes on. It's a long testimony, but I wanted to just read that to you. That's, that's just this past week. And so again, that's why this is so important. So let's dig into this today. We got a lot to cover. And I do this, and remember that for some of you, some of this will be repetitive because you've heard me say it before but uh do we preach on salvation one time and one time only did we preach on the baptism of the holy spirit or the gifts of the spirit or healing or faith or uh the second coming of jesus one time no we have to repeat things because uh there are new people all the time who want, who need to hear the truth and need to uh understand it so uh just bear with me if you know all this but we're going to get into it this morning but anyway Again, I've entitled this The Sevenfold Doctrine of Creation. Uh, this is from a prophecy from the book of Enoch. And as I shared last week, I want to say this again. Uh, the book of Enoch is interesting. Now, one of the reasons that I believe that it wasn't put in the canon of Scripture of our 66 books originally is because, number one, at the time, we didn't have any manuscript evidence to prove it and that there had been some translations of it that had made slight changes of things. So they weren't sure how to check it. Right, so if you if you can't validate something, you don't put it in as scripture. Um, but of course, since that time, uh, the copy of the Book of Enoch, first of all, it was found in like the 1700s in um, in Ethiopia in the Ethiopian Bible, and then we found the manuscript evidence. We found in the Dead Sea Scrolls a partial copy, and then and then later on a full copy of the Book of Enoch, which means that. You know, those scrolls were dated to 300 B.C., but they could have been even older. That's just, you know, some scholars guess, pretty much best guess. But it's pretty well known that uh, Enoch was passed on the books of Enoch, what he wrote. He said in the book of Enoch, in fact, I'm, I'm restudying the book of Enoch, and there's some amazing things in the book of Enoch that are just blowing my mind that I read it all the way through probably around 2008. Um, but it's mind-blowing. I don't, I don't find anything that contradicts Scripture. I know there's a bunch of people out there that's anti the book of Enoch, but 
Um, I do believe we have a, a legitimate book of history that contains the true writings of Enoch. And so uh, that's why, of course, it was uh, quoted word for word, the, you know, in chapter, uh, the first chapter of the book of Enoch was word for word in the book of Jude. And as I began to discover, too, I began to discover, like, uh, some of the early church fathers quoted it regularly, talked about it. Um, Irenaeus, Tertullian. Uh, Tertullian had an interesting thing. I mean, he just went off. He said, you know, I know some people don't accept it as being legitimate, but it is. You know, so, I mean, the early church fathers believed it. And, of course, obviously, the Apostle Jude believed it. Um, but let's just keep going here. Uh, here's the prophecy from Enoch 92, 12. Now, remember, de depending on the translation uh, of the book of Enoch, they put different chapters in sometimes. So it can, get, it can get a little confusing. You might pull up a version, and it's not in 92, but it'll be in that area somewhere. You'll, fi you'll find it toward the end when he's talking about the 10-week the prophecy. But he says here, Afterwards, in the seventh week, a perverse generation shall arise. Abundant shall be its deeds, and all its deeds perverse. During its completion, or toward the end as it's finishing this generation, the, the righteous shall be selected from the everlasting plant of righteousness, and to them shall be given the sevenfold doctrine of his creation. Now, uh, knowing that this book is that old. I mean, we can confirm Dead Sea Scrolls 300 B.C. And the fact that it would say in the last of the last days, in the perverse, wicked generation of the last of the last days, there would be this revelation about creation. Come on, folks. Is that not good stuff right there? That just, to me, is amazing. That's just amazing. And the scriptures confirm this. I'll get to this in a second, but let's Let's go. This, this is the, uh, one of the books that I have uh, by Dr. Ken Johnson. I love his uh, stuff he does about you know, ancient documents, but he basically has his translation of the book of Enoch with his commentary in it, and I have it, and I've started reading it here. And um, in his book, I love the way, this is the way he translated uh, the same verse there, the prophecy in Enoch. He said here, after that, in the seventh week, an apostate generation will arise. Their rebellion will manifest in many different ways. At its close, the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness, we know who that is, that's Jesus, will be rewarded with sevenfold instruction concerning all his creation. So, folks, let me tell you something. We talk about this flat earth, biblical cosmology, biblical creation, revival. This was prophesied. This was foretold thousands of years ago that this would happen in the last of the last days. Well, are we in the last of the last days? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Daniel 12, 9, just to break down some scriptures to talk about how God will reveal things to the righteous and how he was going to seal up or, or hold certain things back until the end. We have from the book of Daniel here, 9, 10. I read this last week, but I'm going to read it again. He said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till, till, until the time of the end. Now think about this. We have Enoch saying it's about creation. God's going to reveal something about the whole creation in the end. Somebody ought to get excited about that because it is happening. This thing is sovereign. It is supernatural. It is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is truth. Unbelievable. And I, and I have never, look, I've been in the ministry now going on. Uh, next year will be, uh, well, this summer will be 33 years. Uh oh, it must mean I'm a Freemason, right? Um, I don't have time to go to lodge meetings, you guys, so don't worry. Um, but 32 years, I have never seen atheists and agnostics. And I said this, and I keep saying this because it's mind-blowing. You just have to understand, this is not just a revival in a local area or a local church. This is an awakening across the world of the lost to the truth of God's word and then to the truth of salvation through Jesus Christ. And God is using the truth of creation and the details and the hints and the little hidden things in his word 
now that he's revealed this with technology, and I was going to bring my new camera today, and I forgot it. Just got me the Nikon P900. All right? And I was going to bring it today, but little tools like that. And people have started to be able to go out and test and prove these things. Uh, but he goes on to say here that the words uh, are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand. Let me tell you something. Who, who's in that? Uh, the wicked. The lukewarm Christians. They're wicked. They're so wicked, Jesus said, they, he's going to vomit them out of his mouth, out of his body. That's how wicked they are. So, you know, we, we say the word wicked, and we think, well, that just means child molesters. No, that means you fornicating, weed-smoking, drunkenness Christians out there who go to church or think you're a Christian, uh, you're wicked. And it's no wonder. I got this wicked, I got this guy on Facebook who claims to be a Christian. He's smoking weed all the time. He's doing selfies of himself practically naked all the time. Um, he, and he's defending witches and Satanists and sorcerers against me. And he claims to be a Christian. No, he's wicked. He's wicked. And he's a liar, too. But we'll deal with him later. But we'll look what it says. That none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And uh, the wise what? We've talked about the ten virgins. The wise have what? Oil in their vessels with their lamp. They have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the leading, the revelation knowledge, the truth that the Holy Spirit brings. He is the spirit of truth. And if you're following him, and he's going to lead you in what? Righteousness and holiness and truth. But if you refuse to walk in righteousness and holiness, are you going to, is he going to reveal truth to you? No, he might reveal some. But you're not going to get the whole truth. So here we go. Let's keep going here. It, it, it gets better. These verses, Psalm 25, 14. I love this verse. I've always loved this passage here. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. You must fear the Lord. You stand in awe of the Lord, fear enough that you will submit to him and obey him and follow him. Guess what? He reveals to you his secrets, meaning everybody's not going to get this, folks. We, we, we get a little frustrated sometimes when people don't hear, don't listen and don't understand, but you got to understand, I don't care if you think they're Christian and they go to the local, you know, mega church in town. Just because they go to church and call themselves a Christian does not mean that they are righteous, that they are walking with Jesus in a relationship, in intimacy, that they hunger for the truth. Because let me tell you, if they were, the, if they did, the truth of the word of God wouldn't offend them. But when you start reading scriptures and they get offended, they're wicked. They're wicked and blind. Remember he said the lukewarm church, he said the lukewarm Christian, he said, you don't even know you're blind, but you're blind. Yeah. Revelation 3, you can read it for yourself. Here, Proverbs 3, 32, the froward or the one who's always departing, walking away from the Lord, the one who's not faithful is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. Well, doesn't that go right along with what Enoch said? He said, to the righteous, there was going to be a reward. There was going to be a revelation about the sevenfold doctrine of the whole creation. Not just part of it, but we were going to know the truth about it. The whole thing. All right? Now, let's keep going. This is good stuff. The word secret. I love this. I had to pull this up because the word secret there when it says the secret of the Lord in Proverbs 3.32, it says accession, the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, the word sowed, accession, look at this, a company of persons in close deliberation by Im implication intimacy. Oh, my. The people that hang out with Jesus. That really hang out with Jesus. That abide in his shadow. That have a relationship with him. A real intimate relationship. That's the ones that are going to be able to see the secrets. Now I was reading this. The Lord led me to this this week. I believe this is a prophecy too. About creation. Why? Because we base things on context. So let's read Psalm 33. I'm going to get a quick drink.
He's reading from Psalm 33. He must be a Freemason, right? I'll hear that. I can't read from Psalm 33. All right, here we go. Psalm 33, of course, in the beginning, talks about praising the Lord with the stringed instruments and all that. You get to verse 6, and he starts talking about creation. Remember, how do we interpret Scripture? Context. With other Scripture and context. Exactly right. So context, context, context. So the context we get into here is creation, because he says here, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Now, he's talking about creation. Everybody in agreement with me? He's talking about creation. And then this verse is thrown right in the middle of it. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. Now, what do you think he's talking about? I'm going to tell you what he's talking about. The word counsel there is the, the plans, the schemes, the imaginations. Look at this. <laughs> this is good stuff right here. He says, first of all, he's not to bring to naught. I love this. It doesn't just mean nice King James to bring to naught. It means to crush, to crush like grapes in a wine press, to destroy. And let me tell you what, what, what God is destroying with the truth of his creation. He is destroying the counsel, the plans, the schemes, the imaginations, the lies of the wicked concerning creation, where they flipped everything on its head. The Big Bang, evolution, you know, the sun 93 million miles away, the earth spinning and spiraling through an endless universe. All this stuff is imagination. All this stuff is their devices, their plans, their wicked schemes to hide the truth of creation and to turn people away from the word of God and ultimately away from finding Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Um, I love this right here. When he says he brings their counsel there to naught, their uh, plans, their imaginations, you see that up there. But look right here, he says here, their artificial work. You know, NASA is Photoshop because it has to be, right, Mr. Blue Marble? I was going to play the video. I, I have too much to cover. I was going to play the video of NASA admitting everything they do is done by artists. Um, but anyway, the Lord says when it says he's going to bring it to naught, none effect, when he's going to bring it to nothing, he's going to make it, look, he's going to make their, their lie decline. Well, how do you make a lie decline? With the truth, and a truth that just keeps getting pounded. You just keep beating the lie, and the lie starts declining. And that's what's happening. Remember, we saw last week. Alex Jones did polls. We saw the little straw poll done by the, the you know, that popular gamer. Forty percent, forty to fifty percent. In just a few years, y'all, you have to understand, yeah. it the the heliocentric Copernican lie. The satanic lie of creation is declining, just like this says here, right? Now, let's go back to our verse. He says, and during his completion, talking about that last perverse generation, as it was coming to an end, the righteous shall be selected from the everlasting plan of righteousness, and to them shall be given the sevenfold doctrine of creation. Now, I'm going to share with you what I believe. I was praying about this. I said, well, Lord, what does that mean? What is the sevenfold doctrine of creation? And I thought, you know, of course, I just wrote a book about all this stuff, 479 pages worth. And I realized, as I just sat there, it just kind of all just went, G -g 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 -g, just kind of downloaded, and here it is. The sevenfold doctrine of creation. This is what I believe it is. Sevenfold means seven things, Right? What is it? So I believe number one is the shape and layout of the earth, what the earth really looks like, how God laid it out, okay? There is the flat earth on that he founded upon the waters, which I've never seen curved water in my life, right? So the water's flat, 
God laid the foundation, laid the earth upon the waters, and then he set the pillars, right, of the earth. He said the, the foundations of the earth, um, and that heaven is always up, and hell is always below. Just the fact that there's an up and down, folks, right? We do, you, don't, you just don't get that on a ball. But number two, I believe, is the firmament. And I talked a little bit about that, but we're going we're gonna to get into all that. Number three, the sun. Because I'm going to tell you, there's a whole sermon you have to do on the sun. That the sun moves and not the earth. Um, and like I said, there's just so much to cover. Of course, the moon giving its own light. And possibly not even a solid. I mean, one scientist in 1965 said it was plasma. So we don't know what it is. Um, they're five of the stars. They're not what they told us they are, right? Number six, the ends of the earth. It's the Bible. This is all in the Bible. The ends of the earth is a phrase over and over again. I had to write two chapters just in, the, in my book just to cover this, and I didn't cover it all. And then number seven is the ether. And the ether, you could say, is the wind, but the different aspects of the wind, and I believe it's a different kind of wind. And we'll talk about that. A little bit. Um, so starting on this one, we're only going to get through part of number one today, the shape and the layout of the earth. Um, this is Proverbs 8, 27 through 29. And remember, this is for some of our new people. I had a guy tell me just last night, he just came into this understanding just this past year. Uh, we kind of take it for granted that some of us have been doing this now for going on five years. Um, but uh, here it is. It says, uh, this is Proverbs 8, 27 through 29. When he, speaking of God, prepared the heavens, the visible arch of the sky, uh, I was there. We're talking about wisdom saying, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep, when he set a compass, when he drew a circle, we'll see that in a second. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. So he says when he did this, when he created the earth, he set a compass upon the face. Now, I didn't put this in this message, but uh, everyone knows we have a geometry teacher that goes to our ministry school, that attends our church regularly. He's not here today, or I'd get John to say it. But face in, is known in mathematics as a flat surface okay um and i'm doing a deep study on the word ponim what's interesting is i'll give you the letters of ponim is the word for face whenever you see face of the earth or face of the waters ponim is the is the word the hebrew letter pay which means the mouth right and then um and then there is a uh, vav which means is the nail which means to secure right and then it says, uh, what is it? It's Yod and then Ma'im, which means the hand of God. So the mouth of God secures with his hand as well something upon Ma'im, the waters. <laughs> so uh, just the word face is giving you this picture of God speaking and his hand working across the flat water. All right? This is Bible, this is definitions of words, this is mathematical definitions. So as we continue here, this is the picture you get, but let's, let's look at the Amplified Bible. Again, just uh, giving you a little idea. Uh, it says, when he established the heavens, I wisdom was there. When he drew a circle upon the face of the deep, drew a circle, not formed a ball. Nowhere in scripture does it say that. The word kug is circle. The word dur is ball. The word kug is used here, the Hebrew word. And he makes it clear. He says when he drew a circle, when he engraved it, if you look it up in Hebrew, when he made firm, solid, strong, the skies. What? I thought that sky out there was just air. But that's the firmament. We'll get into that. Uh, when the fountains and the springs of the deep became fixed and strong, when he set the sea its boundary. Well, wait a minute now. 
there's a there's tsunamis sometimes that take the sea moves miles inland. So is the beach the boundary, or is there another boundary? No, there's another boundary, okay, that it cannot go any further. And that's called the ends of the earth, but we'll get on that later. He said, so that the waters would not tra transgress the boundaries set by him. So the water, there's a place waters cannot transgress. There's a place where they can. So it's not the beach. Just ask the people in Sumatra in 2004 if the water uh, made it inland. Uh, he marked out the foundations of the earth. Of course, the word set here, when it says he set a compass, it means to engrave, to uh, inscribe, to cut in stone or metal tablets. Um, it's interesting because if you look at the letters there, um, the, the cough letter is the hand over something, covering something, and you have the two kuf letters, and kuf is the letter for the arch or dome. Um, so... Even the letters, the Hebrew letters, bear out everything. Um, here's a couple of other translations. The face of the waters. Uh, the complete Jewish Bible. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew the horizon circle on the deep. When he set the skies above in place. When he prescribed boundaries for the sea so that the water would not tra transgress his command. And there's some more when he enclosed the depths. So God put a circle that enclosed. He engraved a circle. He created a circle, not a, not a ball, upon the face of the water. So this is the doctrine. Again, I'm talking about the doctrine of the, the layout and the shape of the earth. This is what it says in Proverbs. Of course, here's the, the picture. I actually have this uh, picture in my office here. Um, the four corners, if God made a circle, if he, if he engraved a circle, he had to engrave it into something. I happen to believe he engraved that circle into a cube, and we don't know how deep it is. The deepest hole ever dug is by the Russians, and that's only about seven or eight miles deep. So we don't know how deep it is, but yet they tell us, remember they tell us it's a molten core right down there, except as you go deeper in the oceans, it gets cooler, right? <laughs> So it doesn't get hotter as you get closer to that core. I don't, I don't understand. Um, but again, I digress. Let the wind blow it away. The four angels at the four corners after these things, Revelation 7 to 1, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on, or on the sea, nor any tree. Now, as I was reading Enoch yesterday, and I spent the entire day studying, reading, and making this, uh, but as I was reading Enoch yesterday, there's an interesting thing. It talks about uh, basically there being portals at four points. And at each of the four points, north, south, east, and west, there's three portals that allow in the wind and the weather and that angels are in charge of those areas. So again, the Bible and the book of Enoch in total agreement. Um, but four corners... And a circle inscribed upon it. And again, if you go back to Proverbs 8, there's a verse where it talks about the inhabitable part of the earth. Well, the inhabitable part of the earth is inside the circle. Uh, we can't inhabit the outside. So there's a part of the earth that's outside the circle. That would be those corners. Right? All right. This Bible, I got, I got the, the Pac-Man people. And the concave earthers, the crazy one, you know, that we live inside of a sphere. We live inside of a sphere. Well, I guess we walk around, you know, I don't know, like the motorcycles getting those. <laughs> China's over there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just crazy. I tell people all the time, these, some of these guys want to argue with me, and I'm like, God said he drew a circle, and he set a boundary for the seas, and that's what I believe. So y'all can take your... Pac-Man theories and everything else on out the window, all right? I'm sticking with the Bible. Now, this is something that I found. I don't recall anybody bringing this up. This is something that the Lord showed me very early on in this. Um, I was preparing a message on the marriage supper of the Lamb, 
I was not studying for creation or cosmology or flat earth or anything. And I was reading this passage right here, and here it says, this is uh, Revelation 27 through 9. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters or four corners of the earth, uh, Gog, Magog, and together them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed or surrounded the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So this is a, an event that's going to happen at the end of the thousand-year millennial reign after Jesus has ruled and reigned on the earth for a thousand years. But it says they went up on the breadth of the earth. And I remember I read that and I went, whoa, whoa. You know, the Holy Spirit just, stop. I was like, why didn't it just say, this is what I heard, why didn't it just say they went up on the earth? Why does it say they went up on the breadth of the earth? And here's the Lord hiding things. Remember it says, it is the, uh, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing and the honor of kings to search out the matter. Proverbs 25, 2. So here he says they went up on the breadth of the earth. So when I looked up breadth, here's what you get. Plateaus. Means width or breadth. But the moment I read plateaus, I was like, oh, wait a minute. That sounds like plateau. And plateau means flat. And then I saw this from 4116, meaning that plateaus is not the root word of this. So what do you do? You keep digging. So I go to the root word, 4116 in the Strong's Greek Dictionary, and you get the word plateaus. Plateaus and plateaus. And here, plateaus means, I couldn't believe it when I saw this, spread out flat. So he said they went up on the flat earth. You see, people will say the Bible doesn't say flat earth. Yes, it does. You just sometimes have to look up. You got to remember the Bible was translated from the New Testament from Greek to English and in the Old Testament from Hebrew or Aramaic to English that we have. And sometimes they didn't always choose the best word. Now, breadth is not incorrect. But when you find out what this means, and then you look at the origin of this word, and here's it all laid out in the Strong's. I show you. Oh, here's another interesting thing. Another word connected to it is plasso. And this is to mold or shape or fabricate. So isn't it interesting? You get in this definition of this one word. You get plateaus, plateaus, and platus. You get this spread out flat. And you get this molding of something. What? Flat. Clay molded out into something. Flat. Again, how do we understand anything in the Bible? We have to study it out. And so anyway, uh, this, this went viral for a while there. But it goes right along with the verse, the passage in Job 38. And this is the passage I entitled my book after. This is Job 38, 14. When it says, of course, the King James says, it is turned... But the word turn there, hafak, means to be changed, right? Just like, it, like if you got leprosy, your skin would change from normal to leprous. Uh, but changed as clay to the seal or the signet ring. Now, recently, I just saw somebody, a flat earther, actually, too, a Christian flat earther, biblical cosmologist, we'll say, try to say, well, this, we can't use this verse to prove the shape of the earth because the context is talking about light. Now, wait a minute. I understand basic grammar. You know, I'm not the best, but I do have a basic concept of it. And whenever it is used, you go back to the last subject. Well, the last subject talked about was earth, right, in the, in the verse before it, which is why other translators said the earth, okay? First of all, if you're going to say it's the light of the sun, how does the light, how does light take shape 
like clay under a seal. But literally, people will start saying this, and people go, oh, that's right. That's deep, man. That's awesome, man. A bunch of kids, oh, yeah, that's awesome. That's deep, man. Now, stick with the Bible, please. Stick with the Bible. All right? So, these other translations, many Hebrew and Greek scholars over the years determined that then the earth is changed like clay under the seal. The earth is changed like clay under the seal. And this is what happens when you take a seal ring or you take, you know, a press. Sometimes they're on a little stick, but sometimes they could be a ring. But when you press that into a ball of wax or a pile of wax or a pile of clay and you press it down, what do you get? Something spread out flat. Something spread out flat. Which, when the first man, in fact, uh, babe, can you do me a favor? Would you go get the uh, popular science for me? Um, I meant to put this in here. But the first man to reach the stratosphere, and I shared this in my, one of my first sermons on this. First man to reach the stratosphere in a balloon, in a capsule he made by himself as a friend of, uh, no, just, you can just break it to me. August Picard. Mr. August Picard. Here we have it. I got in trouble because I was handling it in that people. And people said, what are you doing? But I have the copy. 1931. Popular Science Magazine. We'll walk right over here. Popular Science Magazine. August 1931. I own a copy of it. And in here it tells the story. Ten miles high. In a balloon. August Picard, and he, what does he say? He was the first man to ever reach that height. World record at the time, 51,000 feet, 10 miles high. When they asked him, when Popular Science Magazine interviewed him, and they asked him, what does the earth look like? Did you see the curvature of the earth? What did he say? No, he said the earth appeared to be a flat disk with an upturned edge. Not any downturn, but upturn, which is the same picture you get here with this seal. When clay is pressed down, it's an upturned edge. So see, August Picard had no reason to lie because NASA wasn't formed yet. See? The Freemasons and the Satanists and the occultists that hadn't formed NASA yet to lie to everybody and deceive everybody. And this was just an honest scientist giving honest observation and honest data. And he actually, at 51,000 feet, collected some of the ether, some of the blue air. But we'll talk about that later. All right? But let's keep going here. Yep. Amen. That's right. Uh, my brother here said, kings use signet rings. They do. And he's a king. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. Uh, here's the NIV. For any NIV lovers out there, um, I don't love it, but they actually got this one right. Uh, they got a lot wrong in that one, but th they got this one right. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. So there you have it again. Uh, multiple translations, Hebrew definitions. It's pretty clear. One of the first scientists that was honest, that went up high, high, high in the sky, I'll tell you, there are people, now, now August Picard went up to 51 plus thousand feet. Um, what's funny is you got people so brainwashed that they think that they see the coverage of the earth when they're in an airplane at 28,000 or 30,000 feet. I have flown many, many, many times. I think one of my flights were at 40,000 feet. I have never seen any curve ever. I just flew to Raleigh in North Carolina not too long ago. No curve. You don't see any curve from there. All right? It's in your mind. You are so brainwashed. It's in your mind. In fact, I have footage. I don't have it in this one. We may have it next week. But I had, had a guy come on one of my friend's pages on Facebook and say, he flew on the Concorde and he saw the curvature of the earth, 59,000 feet. Well, I pulled up old videos of Concorde. You know how many people videoed themselves flying on the Concorde and put the... 
video camera to the window? Oh, there's lots of them. Guess what? No curve ever seen. I watched video after video after video after video of Concorde flights. Nope. No curve. And I sent him the videos. I said, show me the curve. Show me the curve. Show me the money, right? <laughs> show me the curve. No, you, you don't show me the curve with your, your cameras or your imagination, your wide fisheye lens cameras. We're going to address that too. Um, Job 38 here. Now, I want to talk about this. I've never really pointed this out. Others have, but I wanted to point this out. And in fact, bring me the guitar, please. It says, uh, this is, again, Job 38, 14. We just read this is the context of creation. Um, either one will do. Mine. Um, it says, whoso darkeneth counsel, the Lord is speaking to Job. So Job 38, 14 is the Lord speaking to Job. I mean, directly. So you, you can say what you want, but that's direct revelation. And he asked Job, he said, Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof thou knowest? Who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now, folks, let me tell you something. Any Christian that says this is just poetic language or metaphors, they don't believe the Bible. God's talking about his creation. Where were you when I measured it, when I laid the line? Patrick, have we built a few things together over the years? Have we laid some foundations? What do we do when we're laying a foundation and we want it to be level and straight? And, and a string, Right? We use a string. Now, what's interesting when he says here, he stretched a line upon it. The word line means a cord, a line, measuring line, right? Down here in the Strong's, it says a cord is connecting, especially for measuring a rule, a musical string. Now, let me just tell you something here. I have never, ever, 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 ever seen, and I play the guitar, and when you put strings on a guitar... What do you do? You lay it down flat, and you stretch them out, and you put tension on them. The word stretch there means you put tension on them. At one point, at, down here on the bridge, and up there on the keys, and uh, brother, are those, are those strings curved? No, they're straight. <laughs> are they curved, Jordan? No, they're straight. This is what the Lord did. He stretched. He's saying, I stretched a line upon it. You see these people doing this right here. Well, there's, there's a guitar, piano, flat level strings there. Oh, they say, oh, they curved it. No, they just bent it so they could get some sound out of it differently. Here's laying the foundation, though. This is what you do. You get a general area, you measure, you get the line so you can get it exactly the way you want it. Here's another one. I highlighted these so you can see them. So there's somebody laying a foundation. Here we go. So the second thing, let's get into some of just the things that we, because you know the Bible says test all things. Hold fast to that, which is good. Every time that somebody sends up a high-altitude balloon, we could do this. We need to do this. We haven't done one ourselves. I know people personally that have done them, but I don't know. Let's think it's about $1,200 or something by the time you buy everything you got to buy to do it correctly. But every time these go up, and I'm going to show you some footage in just a second, 108,000 feet, 120, 121,000 feet. Usually that's about the max before they, the balloons can't handle it any further. Um, but you never see a curve unless you have the fake curve created by fisheye lens that, you know, GoPro cameras use them. But how many, you know what, a lot of you, I'm going to show you in a second, you don't realize that these fisheye lenses that create, that make a fake curve, have been around since 1966. 
NASA started using them real early. I can prove that too. But there's one. Here's 121,000 feet. Another one. Now this is one panning. I want you to see this is a video. And it kind of reached a stable altitude. And so it's just moving. The camera's just moving, showing you a little bit in each direction. Now look at that. Do you see any dramatic curving there? Let me ask you something. How many thousands of miles of straight line are on a ball? See, what blows my mind is the people, even the Christians, who will look at this and not believe it. But they will look at CGI cartoons from NASA and SpaceX and believe that. Let's go to the next one. Several different ones here. Here's another one. Let's see if it's going to do it. There we go. Just enjoy that beautiful bean footage right there for a second. Do you see any curve? Let's go to the next one. I love this one. Look at that. That's three different ones right there. This video goes on for like 17 minutes. You can just watch it go all over the place. And there's so many more. There's so many more of these. But let's just watch. So this is about 120,000 feet, maybe 110, maybe 108, right? But NASA, NASA will start playing games with you and the government. Let's look at this. Here's, here's Felix. Felix got up in his balloon, um, Apollo, I guess we could call this Apollo uh, 18 or 19, because this is exactly what they did. In fact, I've been comparing pictures of this uh, Red Bull capsule to the Apollo capsules. And I see where they had the chains for the hooks and the parachutes and all that stuff, just like he, they do. This is the same thing. He's wearing the same kind of suit they were wearing that will work in high altitude, but not in what they call the, what is it, 10 to the 17 tor space vacuum? No. Uh, anyway, let's watch this a little bit here. This will show you, and they admit that they used the GoPro here. Matter of fact, GoPro was really proud of this, 2012. So in, co in collaboration with GoPro, okay, uh, do you Red Bull, the Red Beast, Revelation. Suit and chest pack cameras. GoPro cameras initializing. Fish eye, wide angle lenses. Because this piece of propaganda is used all the time. Here we go. Felix Boom, Boom Garden. But I wanted you to watch the horizon morph to an extreme curve and then concave and back and forth. Whenever you see that, Pose. You're dealing with a wide-angle fisheye GoPro type okay. lens. Here we're dealing with actual GoPros. I'll show you in a minute. NASA admits they use GoPros as well. I'll show okay, you. Jump already. Jump already. There it is. There's the world out there. Release seatbelt. All right, stand up on the exterior step. Keep your head down, and our guardian angel will take care of you. 
Yeah, he almost didn't make it. He was spinning so hard that he almost passed out right before he needed to pull his chute. But they'll go to great lengths to deceive you. Release the helmet tie-down strap. Four thousand feet, I believe. But watch. What I like about this video is they slowed it down. Watch the horizon. Morphing. So there. It's not curved in a ball. Oh, yeah. Concave, flat to curve. <laughs> but they're gonna. They want you to believe that that's that's the, the curvature of the Earth. And and get this. There's a lot of people that believe that that's the curvature of the Earth. That that's it. That. From 124,000 feet, that that's what it looks like. Because that's how brainwashed people are. I saw it on TV. I saw it. Yep, now it's concave. Look at that. Now it's a ball. Now it's flattening out. So dramatic. I don't know, we're not going to watch the whole thing. I just want you to see some of this. Um, matter of fact, when he hits about 8,000 feet, you can still see the curve. <laughs> so, the people right there are thinking, there, look at that. You can see the curvature of the earth. Felix, the Red Bull jump. See if you can get a respiratory count. He does let out a cuss word. Speed 25 seconds. Speed 600 miles per hour. So he starts spinning. Now look at that. Mach one. Yeah, you can see the whole earth from 100,000, 99, 98, 97. So just want you to see how they use these things. Getting a little rough. <laughs> so look, we're down here. This is sixty two thousand feet. Stable as a rock. 56,000 feet, and it still looks like you can see the whole earth like in a the ball there. So let's keep going here. we got to get through some stuff. Now, I want you to look at the propaganda that they'll put on you. So that, that's 124,000 feet, but we've seen the other balloons, right? All right, here's James May, BBC guy, 2010, flying in the U-2. U-2 can only go up to 70,000 feet. Turn it See the curvature of the Earth. Propaganda. So they're trying to see you see that amount of curve at seventy thousand feet. 
So we're going to go on because he, he annoys me. Here's Mythbusters in 2015 doing the same thing. And this is when Flat Earth was getting huge. So they, 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 they do this propaganda here. Oh, man. That is a lot of horsepower. That's a, wow, we're already lifting. That's crazy. Whoa. Tricky takeoff and rapid initial ascent. Oh my God, the view is beautiful. Huh. Major Bartholomew and Adam get a chance to sit back and relax. Right now we just passed the top of Mount Everest. Until they attain cruising altitude. We're transitioning now from 160 knot climb to a uh, 0.715 Mach cruise. Three quarters the speed of sound. Notice it morphing there as the plane turns. This is the highest up the ground I have ever been. We are coming up on 60,000 feet, 12 miles above the surface of the Earth. The sky has gotten to be a very, very dark blue. What an unbelievably beautiful day. And from this height, 67,500 feet, the edge of our planet has a definitive curve to it. It is uh, the look behind him, more three dimensional it? than I have ever seen it. There 70, feet, they claim that. Ladies right. and gentlemen, 70,000 feet. As it morphs. It was already doing that right there, morphing. At, at this point, 50, aside 000. from the six astronauts on the space station, we are the two highest humans off of planet Earth. More than double the height of a standard commercial airliner. They say, why would they lie? They got GoPro window uh, oh, cameras all over the windows. Look, there it is. Yeah. Look behind him. Stretch Flat horizon behind him. This is not a bad way to spend your day. But when they they show you that, the morphing, the morphing ball. That's what we should call it now, the morphing ball, right? Um, but just to show you, NASA uses... Them too. Look right here. I want you to see this. This is from space.com and over Earth, amazing space. Like footage captured with GoPro. It's 2017. And I just want you to see a little bit of this. So I'm going to show you. They're showing you this. Now remember, the space station claims to be about 250 miles above the Earth, right? Somebody do the math for me on that real quick. 250. Uh, miles uh, in feet times 5,280. One point three million feet, right? And they're showing you the same curve you just saw a minute ago on Felix is 124,000. They're showing you about the same curve when they were at 70,000 feet in the, in the U-2. But they're telling you we use GoPro cameras, and look at that. Now, see, people, again, are going to believe that that right there is the ball Earth when it's done by a camera. I know. <laughs> the land is huge, but look at that. That is not a genuine picture of the shape of the earth. All right? Now let's let's keep going. NASA's been doing this for a long time. Here's a picture. Wait a minute. I thought they could see the whole ball there like they were a minute ago. But they got they got one with a little bit of curve. But wait a minute, they're at the same altitude. So again, we got a morphing planet. Right? The morphing ball. 
Oh, wait a minute. Did they go higher? No. Here's another one from NASA. That one's almost flat. Now, let me ask you, NASA, which picture is real or is any of them real? Without manipulation, without the fake lenses, is any of them real? You, look, where, where did I get this from? NASA's Facebook page. They put out so many pictures, they don't even realize they're contradicting themselves, right? Now, here's this. This Nikon 7.5 millimeter lens, fisheye, they made it in 1966 through 1970, okay? That picture is Apollo 11 taken off, Saturn V. They're looking at it out of a window, maybe about five or six stories up. And notice how curved the Earth is behind it. Yeah. NASA's been using fisheye lenses for a long, long time to make you think you're seeing the curve of the Earth. All right? Now, here's the first picture, allegedly, we took from space, 65 miles up. Now, some of them say space is 62, starts at 62 miles. They get their astronaut wings, you get called an astronaut if you get up to 50 miles, but that's not allegedly space, right? But here's the picture from the V-2 we stole from Hitler, or we confiscated after World War II, 1946. Now, let me ask you something. That's supposed to be 65 miles up. Does that look curved? But let me tell you what NASA did to make you think it was curved. They actually reached 100 miles up. So there, remember the space station, the, alleged, the ISS, the is allegedly at 250 miles up, but this rocket reached 100 miles, and they did a few shots, and they, they got to take these little pictures. Right? So then they piece them together like this. And this is on NASA's website. Pictures, first pictures of Earth from 100 miles, but notice how they, see how they had to piece them together to make that? Well, I did a little something. And what I did here was, here's a picture from the ISS claiming it was 265 miles up. So I took a transparency of the picture from 1946 and put it over it. Oh, wait a minute, how is there more curve <laughs> at 100 miles up than there is at 265 miles up? Mm-hmm. Their pictures, they fake so many pictures, they forget what they've done. Here's another one. NASA Facebook page. You see that? So there's a picture of the fake station. And you got that curve there. And if we put the transparency of the 100 miles, and they're supposed to be at above 250 miles, guess what? More curve at 100 miles. Everybody see that? Isn't that ridiculous? Here's another picture from them. Again, scary. That's, that, that's like practically flat. A minute ago, it's practically a ball. Which is it? And then we got this guy who made your famous blue marble that was on your iPhones when you first got them. And get this. He's a NASA data visualizer and designer. Robert Simon, Mr. Blue Marble. And, he, of course, this is the famous quote. He says it's, it's Photoshop because it has to be. But he talked about, why, he said it's the way I imagine it to be. And he talked about the satellite, the reason that they had to piece it together and Photoshop it together is because the satellite wasn't high enough and it just go around and it would get, get these strip pictures of the ball, right? And so they had to piece them together. Wait a minute. He's talking about all this. He's a NASA employee. He's talking about all this, but what? We're supposed to have satellites that are a million miles away and take a picture of the whole thing. They're really disturbing. That's why God said liars are going to go to hell. You can turn this up. I want you to see this. 
Now, people have done these tests. This is one of my favorites, and, and I, th I think this video is gone. You might not be able to find it anymore. But 7.3 mile test conducted December 9, 2017, uh, the Utah Lake there is going to show you. The reason I found this fascinating, and you'll see in a minute, is a man and his wife. He's on one side with the P900, Nikon P900. So he's giving you the curvature. It should be there. And seven miles is, oh, I All can't right, remember how many feet. Up. But notice he's going to show you. He's got his camera. How high it is. The water is actually frozen there. I think it's about 32 degrees, maybe 31 degrees outside right now. My wife will have a spotlight that direction at Eagle Park. Put this, you see it's standing on the ice right there. There's really no extra inches to be involved here. In the height, about 30 and a half inches. 30 and a half inches, not even three feet. So there should be 21 feet of curvature. 21 feet. Okay. Ground itself, about 28 degrees. 27 degrees. Let's go over the water. So the lake is frozen. You can see it's gonna, 24 degrees. There's the access point. As you can see, there's a smokestack over there that's attached to a ground moving at 1,000 miles per hour. Crazy. Filming that way Probably more towards Eagle Park in Saratoga Springs, Utah. All right, so I'm over at, I'm south of the Linden Marina. Access point. Uh oh, this point is over there. Be filming towards Eagle Park in Saratoga Springs. Just want to show you. I just thought this was fascinating. Is how you can see the reflections on the water from this distance. Now that's probably about seven and a half miles at least away. Maybe even more. But you can definitely see the reflection on the water. When you would, uh, even a centimeter of, ref of curvature would stop that from happening. I yeah, you don't get long right reflections on the curve. the globe model. So here we go. So his wife gets a spotlight on the other side, seven and a half miles away. And she walks down to the water's edge. Um, just under the trees right now. Okay. You under the trees, are you spinning around your light at all? Don't worry, they get it figured out. Is there any light like a near you or? Wait a second. Turn it off. I found you. Turn it on. Yeah, you're in between lights. Okay, I found you. Can you go down the lower now? So she walks on down to the water. Sorry, I didn't have time to edit all this. The peninsula, I definitely see you again. This is awesome. Yeah, there's ice out here, Ben. Yeah, it's this cold. really far out ice. Safe for you? Yeah, I see it perfectly. On the I don't see it now. <laughs> I know. 
Okay, are you out? Uh, are you out to the water's edge yet? Yeah, I'm out to the well, not to the end of the peninsula. Well, you don't need to go all the way. I see you just until you get to a water's edge, because you know, get as much distance as. Want to be at the water's edge? Yeah. Okay. And all you have to do is now lower. You're at uh, where's it at? Like uh, shoulder chest high or? It's on the ice. Do you see it? Uh, I just see glowing. But yeah, I, I can see your reflection in the water sometimes. Shine it on the water a bit. This is shining on the ice. I don't see it. But it wasn't shining at you. Now I see a reflection. Okay. Before it dies or anything, can you lower it as far as you can go? Just tell me, just kind of speak out and tell me where, where it's at. Okay, do you see it? Yes. Okay. Do you still see it? Yes. You still see it? Yeah. You still see it? Yeah. It is on the ice right now. The edge of the light is on the ice. Holy crud. All right, that's pretty much flat Earth. I don't see it. Oh. 21 okay, feet I'm gonna, of keep curve. Keep it on a second. I'm going to zoom out. 21 feet of curve should be there. And, of course, we've done our tests, and I'm not going to... People can view these, but we did a test from Fairhope to Mobile... 12 miles, different places 11, some places 12 plus. So this right here, Fairhope to the I-10 bridge going across the bay right there is 10.12 miles. There's the I-10 bridge. It's 16 feet above the water. I checked with the Alabama Department of Transportation. As you can see, a, an 18-wheeler went over when it was. So that's, that's how low it is. The average height of an 18-wheeler is 13.6 uh, feet, right there. I called the Alabama Department of Transportation and talked to that gentleman, Dan Warner, who's an engineer, and I asked him about these bridges, how high they were, and that's 16 feet right there above the water. Here's where we were in Fairhorp, so 10 miles. At 10 miles, the camera's 5 feet. This should be 36 feet, so another 26 feet which is almost a three-story building, all right? Eight inches per mile squared, that's how they figure this. That's how you figure the alleged ball right there. There we are, 10 miles, 66 feet, but we put in the height of the camera, so it lowered that number. But here we are, cars and trucks crossing the I-10 bridge from 10 miles away. Now, the reason we lose a little bit underneath it is because of the the glare and the perspective issue, um, but 16 feet is all we're losing right here in the haze. But you you see the cars. This is this is not a mirage. We see the cars moving, going back and forth across there, 10 miles away. That was our own test with the P900, Nikon P900, the video mode. Um, we did the same thing. Uh, See, that's what should be, you should see. You shouldn't see anything but the treetops. Okay? Um, of course, in April 2016, we did a test there. We saw these cranes all the way to the where they sit on the ground, 12 miles away. Should be impossible. There should be uh, a good 60-plus feet right there. And so, there you go. Well, we were generous. All right? All right, and just to show you again, this, was, this is a time lapse of the Chicago picture. Now, this is what we want to go do maybe toward the end of April, early May. We want to go to the same spot here pretty soon with the P900 and see what we can see across Lake Michigan. But this was a time lapse, not just a picture, but a time lapse of the Chicago skyline from over 50 miles away across Lake Michigan. And, I mean, we go from, from day to night, so... Uh, that's a long mirage if it's a mirage. And at 52 miles, you say um, the tallest building should be hidden, should be hidden under 900 feet. Shouldn't you be able to see it? All right? That's pretty serious stuff here. Here's another one that I found just to show you guys this. Recently, an article came out not too long ago about uh, uh, the Navy's uh, deploy. They're going to deploy this laser weapon. You see this right here? This laser weapon to shoot ships and to shoot cruise missiles down. 
And that next to it's a Russian cruise missile. Well, you know, I did a little, little search. So here's the article from Defense News. It says, when it comes to missile killing lasers, the U.S. Navy is ready to burn its ships. So this article is May 22nd, 2019. And it says right here, the requirement for the laser stems from pro proliferation of high-tech anti-ship cruise missiles that travel at ever-increasing speeds with greater degrees of sophistication. Old Aegis uh, doctrine called for ships to shoot two anti-air missiles at an incoming threat. Uh, look to see if it was the first salvos were effective, then shoot again. Ideally, an incoming missile wouldn't get within 100 miles of its intended target. Now, wait a minute now. How does that happen? And they say that this right here, this laser weapon is going to do that for them. So I calculated that the height of the laser weapon on the ship would be 80 feet off the water. That's pretty high up. So I, got, I was pretty generous there. And I talked to the lieutenant colonel about this as well. He said, yeah, that's a good number. So 80 feet off the water, 100 miles. Guess what? Comes to... Uh, 5,287 feet of curvature. That is uh, seven feet above a mile. A mile of curve. That should be in between the ship and the cruise missile approaching it. Now let me ask you something. How do you shoot down a cruise missile with a laser 100 miles away on a ball earth? Yet they're spending gazillions of dollars to develop this weapon and to deploy this weapon. Let me tell you what they know. They know it's flat, don't they? Guess what I found out about Russian cruise missiles? Not hard. Just do a little research. So the new Russian cruise missile has some interesting specs about it. It's the 3M54 caliber. All right. I want you to notice over there to the right. Here we go. That's this little it's specs on it. The flight ceiling on this is 100 meters. All right. That's the flight ceiling. 3,800 feet approximately. But the flight altitude is 50 to 100 meters and 20 meters over the water. Now, if it's, if it's a cruise missile heading to a ship, and it's flying 20 meters, which is about 65 feet. I checked. 20 meters, 65 feet off the water. And there, remember, the flight ceiling, 100 meters, 3,280 feet. Wait a minute now. That's the flight ceiling of the cruise missile. That means that's as high as it can go. Yet there's 5,280 feet of curvature over 100 miles between the ship and the cruise missile and the laser that's got to shoot it down. They're busted. Can somebody say they're busted? They're busted. They're busted. And I don't even have to get into the government documents. I'm going to get into those next time a little bit more. Matter of fact, there's some, one, some that I found... When I was writing the book that I didn't, I didn't do in the message I did uh, in 2018. So what we're talking about is the doctrine, the sevenfold doctrine of creation. And right now, just number one, the layout, the design, the shape of the earth, it is not a spinning, flying ball with a circumference of 24,901 miles. That doesn't work. And, you know, I've had people go on record with me, a lieutenant colonel, a Navy missile instructor, say they put line of sight, eyes on, ships 60 miles away. How do you do that? How do you do that? So you need to understand something. The reason that the truth, the truth, number one, the truth that God taught in his word that the earth is flat, immovable, stable, fixed, still, and at rest, set on pillars, fastened, he said, that it has a foundation, that it's strong, that it's not moving, 
Zechariah 1.11, that it's still and it rests. Oh, yes, it has contours, but it's flat. And I didn't even get time to get this, but the, the engineer, the former aerospace engineer, Jay Tolan, how many of you have seen some of his videos? Jay Tolan, y'all haven't seen Jay Tolan? He is a former, he, I mean, he worked for, I think, Raytheon and some of these other aerospace companies. He's an engineer. This guy is smart. Uh, he just did his own gravity test. And I'm like, okay, you're freaking me out, dude. But he's the one that's equipped his cameras and stuff with infrared. And he just flew, but the recent one he just did, he just flew from South Florida, across Florida, across the Gulf of Mexico, flying, I don't know where he's flying, back to Texas or somewhere. He's flying across there. He's got his window seat. At the end of the video, I mean, you can see all the, this is what's wild. He's in the Gulf of Mexico, so you can see the Gulf of Mexico. Then you see the land, you see Florida, then you see the ocean again. And once he, he shows where the, the altitude of the plane was 28,000 feet, he does, he says, as he puts it, the simple trigonometry. And he showed that he was seeing with infrared, which got rid of the haze. And he shows you, he took the, the infrared lens off, hazy, couldn't see. Puts the infrared lens on, you can see 1,200 miles. Aerospace engineer with infrared cameras in a plane at 28,000 feet, and he says, behold your flat earth, people. This is why the truth is winning. If there was nothing to it, Atheists, agnostics, engineers. When we did our first test in April, April of, of 2016, we had a guy that had been an engineer for 30 plus years with us. We're not talking about dumb people. We're not talking about hillbillies in the mountains or in the woods. No, we're talking about former military officers, instructors, Engineers. May, yeah. May I ask a question? Go ahead. Um, I know during the um, the president's State of the Union address the other night, he was talking about the Space Force and all this extra money and being the first Americans be the first one to land on Mars. Can you comment on that? Well, here's what I believe. Now, again, I can't prove it, but here's what I believe. Now. We're going to get into this when we get to the part about the ether. Because there is a realm that we reach at about 73 miles, I think, that where we hit the thick level of very dense ether, blue air. And it's different. And we're going to I'm going to show you that. I'm going to talk about that. Now, they learned over the years how to... This is why they, they developed two-stage rockets, because one stage wasn't enough to get punch into it far enough. And they learned if they can punch into it far enough and deploy a balloon satellite that um, it'll stay, it'll, it'll move in a circular pattern over the flat earth, just like the sun and the moon, because that's the, the ether, I believe, pushes the sun and the moon in their circular path. And they learned that they can keep a satellite up there for 14 days. All right? Now, satellites, all satellites, I'm going to tell you, are on balloons. All of them. I, I, have, the, I have the declassified documents to prove it all. Because uh, I dug them out, all right? So there is a place when they, a lot of them when they say space, they know in your mind you've been taught the heliocentric Big Bang Star Trek lie, exactly. So when they say space, so I believe some of these guys, Trump maybe, some of the other high ups, when they're talking about space, they're talking about controlling this realm, okay? And that's why I have a declassified document that I talked about, the Russians were furious back in the day talking about that the United States was trying to, and this was their words, trying to uh, control or have supremacy of the ether. All right? So we're going to talk about the ether and what it is and all that, but they, this high altitude level, it's not outer space. It's not outside in some vacuum. It's not some endless black void. Um, but there is a realm that they call space. And it, to me, I just call it the ether realm. All right? So they do and can, as they deploy satellites on these balloons, they can deploy weapons as well. 
And I think that more and more countries have figured out, with rocket technology expanding, have figured out how to deploy a weapon on a balloon that they can just fly over. The balloon flies over the United States. They just drop it, right? So when he's talking about a space force, he's talking about uh, that the war has gone into this realm, okay, to the ether realm. Um, and it's just a higher altitude. Like, I, I actually believe it's about 73 miles, and I can, I can pretty well prove that, all right? Um, but anyway, I think, too, let's just say for a second, let's say Trump as president of the United States, let's say he knows the truth. I believe he does. But if you're president of the United States in this atmosphere right now, if you're the Republican president, and particularly if you're Trump, um, if you step forward and said the earth is flat and stationary and there's no such thing as outer space, they would, what's the, what's the article? Is it 22 or 26? Article 26 of the Constitution that unfit, you're crazy, we're going to remove you from office on grounds that you're crazy, right? And he would have most Republicans even turn against him. And so if I was president of the United States and I was trying to do some other things, I was trying to fight some evil and deal with some bigger problems, um, that wouldn't be my priority to come out and say the earth is flat, all right? That just wouldn't be my priority. Now, there may be a time for it, maybe down the road, because, see, one of the things about politicians is they always lick their finger and stick it in the wind. Now, if enough of us believe it, guess what? They'll all of a sudden start believing Yeah, we knew it all along. We just couldn't tell y'all. It was classified. You know, that day may come when it's just finally acknowledged this is the way it is. You know, and, of course, when they admit we're in a terrarium, you know, the, the, the argument, even now the argument is for many people out there, even in, in the science world, they believe in a creator. It's just, who is he? You know, some of them now have believed, well, it's aliens. It's an it's a alien, you know, civilization far more advanced that seeded us here, and they're going to come back and take care of us. Well, we know what that is, right? But there, there will be a point where I don't think there's any more argument. There'll be any more argument anymore, especially, look, if we keep putting the facts, see, these, this is what I'm talking about. We have biblical truth and facts to back it up. We have facts. We have it. And we have real science and real experiments and real observations. This is not just a bunch of religious fanatics running around going, we believe the earth is flat up. No, it's Bible, and it can be proven. In fact, it can be proven so much, I can't even get it all in in one sermon. There's so much evidence, all right? So let me say this out there. And I said it last week, and I want to say it again before we close today. If you're a Christian, and you know the tr this truth, you've seen the evidence, you've seen it in the Word of God, you believe it, but you won't share it, you are not helping us win. we got to quit being ashamed of the word of God. And like I've said many times, we already believe that God created the heavens and the earth. We already believe that Jonah was swallowed by the big fish and was in his belly for three days and then spit up on land and went and prophesied to a city that, that repented of their sins. I mean, we believe Jesus died on the cross. God in the flesh died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead on the third day. We believe he was born of a virgin. We believe that the breath of God, the, the Holy Spirit power of God, his spirit moved through men and wrote a book that is supernatural revelation from him that has truth in it that's blowing us away. I mean, just, just, just one Bible prophecy that's happening. Now, it just ought to be mind-blowing enough, the whole press toward the mark of the beast. And foretold 2,000 years ago in this book. Show me another book that foretold it 2,000 years ago. You can't. Details. That's why, folks, you can trust the Bible. Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to Revelation. You can trust it. You can trust it with your life. 
and more so with your eternity. So you hear me? Now let me say this before we close. I know it's, it's, this has been one of those longer ones today. But it's time. If, you, if out there, if you have not come to see this, open your eyes, start looking at all the evidence. I'm going to do my job to put it out there to you. You can check me on any of this. The scriptures, the articles, the documents, you can check it. Do your own research. And if you do it with an honest and open heart, you're going to come to the, 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 the reality. The Bible is the inspired, infallible word of Almighty God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. He is the only way to be forgiven of your sins and to inherit eternal life. There is a heaven. There is a hell. There's going to be a judgment day. And we will give an account of how we lived our lives. And people get mad at me when I say it, but if you don't believe that Jesus is Lord, that he is God, and that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead, if you don't believe that and you're not willing to repent, turn your life over to him and follow him, you will not be saved. You will not go to heaven. People get so offended at that. I'm sorry. Buddhism may be nice, but it's of the devil. People got mad at me because I, called, because I said Islam was of Satan. It's of Satan. Islam's of the devil. It is satanic. It is antichrist. Oh, but there's, such, there's some sweet Muslims. Good for them. But their religion is satanic, demonic, and antichrist. And Jesus warned their religion would rise up. So it's not about being mean. It's just there, God, the creator who made this place, he ain't confused. He didn't create 15 million ways to get to him. He created one. One. And he gave you a book with details and prophecies that's been confirmed by manuscript evidence and archaeological discoveries and just math. And now we're discovering that even the details that people, Christians are saying are metaphors and poetry, we're finding out, nope, it's actually literally accurate. The sun moves, not the earth. Amen? All right, let's stand. I'll quit. <laughs> Hope you learned something today. Hope he gave you, maybe even some of you that know this really well, maybe he gave you one more tool to use. But let me tell you this, for those of you, you Christians out there, people around you say, well, people around me are going to mock me, laugh at me, persecute me if I start talking about this. Well, so what? Give them the word of God. Give them the proof. Give them the evidence. In fact, it really shakes them up when you're bold about it. Yeah. Somebody said, you believe the earth is flat? I said, no, 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 no. I don't believe it's flat. I know it's flat. Right. How do you know that? Well, I've tested it myself. Have you ever t done an earth curvature test? <laughs> what are you talking about? Over a long distance with high zoom cameras and telescopes and lasers. Have you ever done something like that? No. Oh, so you don't know. You've never done it. Well, I have. So that's why I can say I don't just believe. It's not just a, it's not just a belief. I know I have tested it and proven it myself across Mobile Bay like four times. And we're going to do that again. Oh, by the way, we're going to do that February 29th, 28th and 29th, Friday and Saturday. We're going to Mobile again because i got to use my new P900. I was using somebody else's before. Now i got my own. Um, Thank you, Lord. That's a blessing. They say, why didn't you get a P1000? Because uh, P900 was cheaper and about the same camera. There's not much difference between the two. Um, but we're going, to, uh, we're going to do that. We're going to take the level 5 laser that I was given a few years ago that I haven't used yet, and we're going to set that up Friday night 
hopefully the restaurant there in Mobile will let us do that that's right on the bay on their little deck and we're going to set that up and shoot back to Fairhope and we're going to have Jordan or somebody down in Fairhope to find our purple laser beam uh, at night but then the next day we'll do we'll be at the uh, Fairhope North Park Beach I always get it back with either North Park Beach or North Beach Park in Fairhope uh, <laughs> I can't remember I always get them mixed up but we're going to go back to the same spot and uh, do another test and February is the perfect time to do it. It'll be perfect. Um, the weather's supposed to be good, so it'll be, um, you know, in the high 50s by the time, you know, for the high that day, so it'll be perfect. So we're looking to do it. We're definitely going to do that. So anybody that wants to join us, I know we have some people told me that you want to go with us when we go to Mobile. And let me say this. If you've never been to do it for yourself, to see it for yourself, you need to go. You, so you can look through the camera on the beach and see it for yourself. I encourage you because then you can say, no, 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 no. I was on the beach with the high zoom camera and I saw it. We had people walking up. It was so much fun. We had people, what are y'all doing? Well, we're testing to see if the earth is curved or not. <laughs> what? I said, come here. Look in this camera. What do you see over there? Well, I see a boat. I said, that's 12 miles away. You see the boat in the water, don't you? Mm -hmm. I said, don't, do you know the curvature of the earth, what it's supposed to be, what you should be able to see and not be able to see? No, I don't know that. And then you explain it to them. I said, people sit there. I mean, we had a whole group come up just going, huh? <laughs> oh, really? Well, tell me, do you see it? Look through the camera. What do you see? Do you see those cranes all the way to the ground? Do you see that or not? Do you see those cars going across the bridge? Oh, yeah. Freaks people out, man. Then you start saying this was in the Bible all along. And, I mean, we just have a, a good old witnessing time, preaching time right there on the beach, unashamed. See what I'm saying? I don't care. Come on. Everybody come. Everybody. I don't care. Scientists from Auburn University, you're welcome. Come on. Come on. Join us. You, you can do the math. You can write it out in the sand if you want to. All right? Bring your calculator if you need it. All right. Astronauts, y'all are welcome too. Do no one. All right. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for your truth that is setting people free. Lord, you said that those who would continue in your word would know the truth and the truth would make them free. And so, Lord, we thank you for every truth that's in the Bible, Lord, from Genesis to revelation, the truth of your creation, the truth of your salvation through what you did on the cross and your resurrection from the dead and the truth of your second coming and all the things that would surround that. We are grateful, Lord, that you have given us both a book with your truth in it and that you give us your Holy Spirit of truth. And so, Lord, I ask you to just touch people right now, those that don't know you, those who aren't truly born again, they've never been saved, they've never truly given their lives to Jesus, I pray today they will do that because they know they can trust the Bible as truth, as truly the words of the living God, the creator, and there's only one true creator, the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, one God, believe in him, turn to him, follow him. Father, I pray for these people. And I thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to get out of here today. I've kept you long enough. So here you know the rules. Hug some necks before you leave.